All right. Thanks for joining us here on the Gill Athletics Connections podcast. Really excited to have our guest today. I've got Mr. Joe. I want to say it's so fancy now, Joe. Joe Frontier. Joe Frontier from Madison Throws Club up in beautiful Madison, Wisconsin. Joe, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mike. Pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's always fun to talk to throws guys because you have at least four events to talk about. You know, when I talk to a vault guy, they just want to talk about pole vault. <laughs> so this we, got pl- we, got, we, got, we got stuff to talk about. Absolutely. So, Joe, you do, uh, you do a lot, man. You are a high school throws coach at James Madison High School, James Madison Memorial. You also have your own throws club, your own private club, which is just throws. Definitely we want to make sure we talk about that. And then I am super jealous. You run a very successful podcast, the Throw Big, Throw Far podcast, that um, we definitely want to talk about that and some of the amazing guests you've had. You just had the, the all-powerful Kibway Johnson on there just this week. So uh, definitely want to talk to you about that. So maybe we start with Joe. Talk to us about, give us kind of who you are and what you do now, and we'll work from there. Sure. Well, um, I'd be remiss to say that uh, if I if I didn't say I, I teach, I'm a teacher um, before I get to go out to uh, track practice at the end of the day. Um, I teach art, which um, I just had a long conversation with um, uh, another throws coach from Texas. And he's like, so what do you do for a day job? And I said, I'm an art teacher. And he said, what? I never would have guessed that in a million years. Um, so yeah, I teach art, I teach photography and video actually at the high school level at Madison Memorial High School in Madison. That's I've been there really 20 years. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of art throw, art thrower hybrids out there. And, uh, I don't know why there, there's a, I suppose there's a, there's a hybrid of everything, but people we, always say, Oh, didn't Al order like paint yeah. after he stopped throwing the discus? Yes. I was just about to say, we did some, um, some, our Hollywood discus for, and I was pretty sure it was Al order for his uh, art and paint and things like that. I think he had a foundation maybe yeah. centered around it as well. Yeah, that's so really there, there cool. Are, there are a couple other art hybrids, but I, I'm all digital. So I teach digital photography and digital video production and uh, have a blast doing that. But, um, you know, I am super passionate about the throws. Um, I've always been kind of a passionate sports person i'm watching the last dance not to turn off any anti-bulls people out there but (laughs) like i'm reliving my youth i was uh my dad's from chicago and even though i grew up in wisconsin i was kind of weaned on chicago sports the blackhawks my dad was a college hockey player and um so i grew up on the blackhawks the bears the white Sox, and then the bulls and i was like in the perfect wheelhouse of like you know i was 10 years old when the Bulls drafted Michael Jordan. So like when you are like the most fascinated by athletes, I got to watch Michael Jordan and I got to watch Walter Payton. And um, so uh, I don't know. I think I just fell in love with sports. I fell in love with the Olympics um, at a really young age. I remember pretty vividly my brother who is five years older than me and my dad, um, you know, freaking out over the miracle on ice, which was on tape delay, which I didn't know anything about what was going on. I just knew it was a really big deal. And, um, and so the Olympics were always a big thing in my, in my house. Um, and, um, my brother was a baseball player as I was, my dad played a lot of baseball and, um, he quit baseball and he did track and all of a sudden he was like throwing the discus and older than me, um, you know, I looked up to my big brother and, uh, was he pretty good? I was like, he was decent. You know, he was a soccer player, which was an interesting hybrid. Not a lot of soccer playing discus throwers. Right. So I think it was just something that he put a lot of pride in cause it kind of was one of those things. And I think I've heard many people talk about track and field in this way, where it's like, you know, you got out of it, what you put into it, as opposed to a team sport where sometimes that equation doesn't work out. And mm-hmm. I think that's something that really fascinated me. I grew up playing tons of baseball and then in middle school, um, you know, we had a middle school track team, which there aren't a lot of middle schools that still have track, uh, at least in my area, which is a bummer, but, um, was pretty decent at it, um, without a lot of coaching, but had coaches who encouraged me to, you go over there and you keep throwing that thing and you'll get better at it. And, um, did you grow up 
you said Wisconsin, closer yep. to Chicago or closer yeah, so up to the Madison area? I grew up in Racine, Wisconsin. So Racine is like kind of in between Chicago and Milwaukee on the lake. Yeah. Okay. And um, and so that's where I grew up. And uh, yeah. And did, so, you ever, did you ever play hockey? Your dad was a hockey player. Yeah, Miracle of I, Ice was a big deal. I played hockey when I was really young. So my dad would literally flood our backyard and we had an ice rink in our backyard every winter. That is old school. Yeah. So I, I love that. Like the first winter I could walk, I think age two, I was in ice skates. And uh, <laughs> so I played organized hockey when I was really young, but there was no organized like hockey leagues in Racine itself. Kenosha, which is south of us, had, you know, had an ice arena and had organized like club hockey. And so I played that. But at some point, like the drive back and forth to Kenosha, it wasn't like club sports today where parents are insane. insane. Um, I, and I say that because my, my, my older brother actually has kids. Uh, my niece and nephew are hockey. They're a hockey family and they're like in a car all the time. And you're a club owner. <laughs> yes. And I'm a club sport <laughs> owner. So I understand the insanity. Actually, and we could talk about that later is the flip uh -huh. side. I'm making these parents drive to me to get coached. <laughs> So maybe uh, that it uh, everything is full circle. But anyway, so, um, did you follow yeah. your brother's footsteps into the discus? So I did. I had a really hard decision in high school. I actually wrote a letter to my athletic director asking me asking him if he would let me do track and baseball at the same time. Wow! And uh, that letter came back as a hard no. <laughs> and um, I actually went to my high school because my brother and sister went to a parochial school in Racine. And I went to the public school because they had volleyball. I played volleyball in middle school and I loved it. Wow. And uh, they didn't have volleyball at the parochial school. So I ended up going to the public school to play volleyball. Except my eighth grade gym teacher before I got to high school was the freshman football coach. And he talked me into playing football. I had never played organized football in my life. Um, and I ended up being the quarterback. I don't know how. I hated every single second of football practice my freshman year. As a quarterback? I, I, I could not have hated football more. Wow. Um, I just, it did not click with me at all. And so uh, I think that probably had a lot to do with me then choosing track in, in high school over baseball. Like the, the, the team aspect of it, the coaches did a lot of yelling. It was a very barking oriented. The coach who kind of got me to do it was, was a saint the position coaches were less than saintly, I guess, uh, at least the in my stereotypical. Football yeah. Coaches. You know, and I hate to throw them under the bus. It was, yeah. I was, you know, 15 years old and you know, perception is oh, sure. probably skewed a little bit, but maybe they were yelling. Cause I was, I was, I might've been terrible. I, I had no perception of how good I was. I would just happen to be the quarterback. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I, I asked my dad, I want to quit. I don't want to play. He's like, no, you made a commitment to it. That was a big learning lesson for me. Yeah, dad had it on point. And um, which another side story, my dad actually, the summer after track. So I decided to play track, um, play track. I decided to do track, which was an incredibly good decision. Right after track ended at the end of the school year, the head football coach calls me in his office, gives me a playbook and like a bag full of footballs and tells me all this stuff that I need to be doing this summer. And I'm like walking out of his office thinking like, there's no way I'm playing football next year. And I get home, I tell my dad what happened. And my dad's like, you got to call him and you got to tell him that you're not going to play football. You can't let him think that, you know, you're all doing right. all this Counting stuff all you. summer long. That was a really hard phone call to make. And yeah. uh, how did he take it? it? he was amazing and he actually ended up being my gym teacher like two years later and he was always good to me he like respected me for holding up my end of the bargain which i probably wouldn't have done had my dad not forced me to respect right. that that coach and thank uh, god for dad <laughs> well you know when again when you're 15 you're you're, you're you know you have a warped perception of what your duties are what your responsibilities are so anyway, I ended up playing volleyball the next three years, which is a really good decision. It was a very competitive team, and we won a couple state championships. And track worked out uh, very well for me. I and I fell in love with my track coach, who was just amazing. His name was Bruce Hammond. He um, went to the University of Minnesota. He actually played for the Vikings for a little bit. Wow. And by the time I he was my coach, um, he 
you know, needed two knee replacements and probably had some hip problems and wasn't a great demonstrator, but was an incredibly gifted communicator of ideas and was, uh, a, he, he was someone you wanted to go into war for. Wow. And uh, that really changed the scope of my kind of my sporting experience, especially after kind of my football experience, which is interesting. Um, and uh, how, how yeah, did he? I, so he obviously did things differently. And uh, was he the throws coach? He was a throws coach and he was one of the varsity football coaches, but I never had him as a football coach because right. I ended up playing volleyball. But yeah, so he was the throws coach only, shot put and discus. And so in, um, interesting, he couldn't do a lot of the drills, so he had to communicate. Yeah, you're right. You talked about him being an, such a good communicator. He had to really work on that side since he couldn't show positions and things like that. Yeah, I mean, he was a great motivator, um, a great communicator, and um, just very in, inspirational. I would say, you know, he he he. I bonded with him. You know, there's, there's no other way to say it, but, you know, I saw him as a mentor and I saw him as someone who I trusted that had my, he wanted me to succeed. And um, there's value in that. You know, I think everyone is searching for those people who believe in you, who have something to offer you, who challenge you. Um, you know, he wasn't a pushover at all. It, it, you know, mm-hmm. practices were hard. He, he demanded hard work, but he made fun. He made, he made the hard work fun and he made the hard work. He valued the hard work. He appreciated, you know, at the end of a hard practice, you know, he would put you through the ringer and, you know, he was the one, you know, you, you pull you off the ground after kind of a grueling hill, hill run or something like that, you know, and you kind of, crash on the last rep and you're laying on the ground gasping for air and you catch your breath and he's telling you you know that was that was exactly what we needed to do today and then you know he's grabbing your hand and pulling you up and uh you know those are valuable experiences uh in in young people's lives and really something that i pull a lot of my a lot of my ethos a lot of my you know a lot of my approach to coaching uh i think was informed by by coach hammond and he passed away a couple years ago and uh um but you know lived a very full life and um uh i was gonna say you know obviously this is a mentor of yours yeah back now do you find yourself doing a lot of the same styles the ethos as you as you spoke of well that's funny i mean from a throwing technological standpoint you know he was a great glide technician um and was not a great discus coach and i ended up being a a, i don't want to say a great glider i was a better than average glider Hmm. and i was a not very great discus thrower so you know i kind of you know i became i came out of that mold that he provided for me you know he gave me everything he could everything he knew and he knew a lot about the glide shot put and not a lot about the discus and i came out as as a as a pretty darn good glider and, and a technician but um yeah, you know, I think um, he gave me a, a VHS tape of uh, Randy Matson mm. and said, hey, I want you to watch this. And uh, I, I wore that thing out. It snapped off like the center little white circle in there. I watched it so often. Wow. Um, I just did a webinar the other day with Dan McQuaid and whoever was listening out there and uh, um, talked about technical models and in looking back at Randy Matson, who I haven't really looked at for a few years, um, but I knew that my <coughs> I had definitely evolved from kind of like trying to do what I've seen in the Randy Matson video over and over and over again to something more like Al Feuerbach by the time I was a senior, you know, which was a very different approach to glide in terms of like setup and dropping in and teen and, and, um, things like that. So, um, from a technical standpoint, you know, he put it in front of me, you know, I just think like, Hey, that was close to, uh, that was 30 years ago, my freshman year. And to think about, you know, what we have access to now in terms of YouTube and, you know, the fact that my throwers can follow the best throwers in the world and see what their practice video looked like from the day before on Instagram. And as opposed to, I was just like worshiping this tape that I had because the only thing I could hold on to that I could see. Not only can they watch all the great throwers, what they did yesterday in practice, they can 
almost communicate with every one of these stores. They can send a tweet or a DM and these guys and gals typically will respond. Yeah. We don't know how good, I hope, well, I should say it this way. I hope coaches today, especially young coaches that don't have anything else but YouTube and the Facebook groups we have and things like that, I hope they realize just how good we've got it right now. Not only with that information that you can see, but the exchange of ideas. I, I was thinking about, as you were talking about, Coach, about, you know, I was thinking like, well, where did he learn to throw and who did he talk to? He would have had to have gone to the state clinic if we even had one back then to maybe talk to people. Uh, he couldn't have emailed anybody. He couldn't have uh, tweeted anybody. There was no Facebook, etc. Yeah. Now I can talk to a hundred great throws coaches tonight. I'm talking to one of them right now. This is the awesome part. Uh, I got 99 others I could go talk to right now if I wanted. It's that easy. We've got it so good. Oh, we totally do. We have a lot of information that is at our fingertips. And sometimes that's amazing. I think coaches have no excuses to take advantage of some of the, the things out there. I think the hard part for athletes, and like I said, you know, I was a 15 year old, probably, you know, perception is everything. Um, you know, kids, they, they're not sure what they should be looking at. You know, I think there's definitely good things and bad things. How kids synthesize why you know, this part person's doing this technique or this person's doing that, or, Hey, I just saw, um, I just saw Joe Kovac squat 705 pounds, 10 times in his garage. Maybe I should do that. You know, that's a bad idea. Um, you know, so I do think that knowledge, uh, knowledge is power, but I don't know that kids always know how to wield it. So See, uh, that's, sifting... that's how I know I'm talking to one of the top 100 coaches uh, right now. You, your good advice there of don't kid, don't go try to do 10 by 700. <laughs> don't, don't do that. That would be bad. Um, that was crazy, man. That was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so, you brought up uh, coaches clinic, yeah. you know, back then. Um, so my senior year, um, my, my high school coach, Bruce Hammond, took me out of school and snuck me into the Wisconsin State Coaches Clinic, like brought me to the coaches clinic. It was just coaches. And then I was like, I don't know, I I um I have a beard now. I, I had a shitty looking beard as a high school senior. And I thought I was trying to like look like a coach. And I am pretty much absolutely positive that every single person in that room knew that I was not a coach. Um you thought you he, pulled it off though, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I was looking like super sophisticatedly old and I totally looked like an 18 year old kid. Like, um, probably also like there were probably some coaches in there who like, you know, knew and saw me throw the year before. Right. Exactly. Like, what yeah. the hell are you doing here? <laughs> but that was really, I mean, that was amazing that he would say, Hey, I can't demonstrate this stuff. Let's go bring you to this. And oh, to yeah. expose me to that experience, you know, that was a really, it was a great honor to like spend a day with my coach. Like I felt pretty cool and special and, you know, he took me out to breakfast beforehand. We drove to Milwaukee yeah. and that was, that was a really cool thing that he did. Was uh, the for idea me. of being a teacher and a coach in your head at this point as an 18 year old or. So, I mean, at 18, I, I come from a family. My dad was a principal in our school district. I never had him as my principal. So I come from my, my dad's brother was a principal in Chicago, in Illinois. Um, my brother turned out is, you know, went into teaching and is now a professor. Uh, my mom worked at a different high school in, in oh, my man. town. So, so I come from a family of educators. And so education was definitely on my mind. I was pretty artsy in high school. I was kind of like mm -hmm. art, sport. I like science. I kind of straddled a bunch of social, social niches in my high school. And um, now I, I think I was trying to avoid, I went to college I went to the University of Wisconsin and my game plan was to I was a kinesiology major and I thought I'm gonna get my science degree and then I'll go to like a design school I want to design tennis shoes that was like my 17 year old oh, 18 yeah. year old dream job um, and then I took organic chemistry and then How'd I wasn't, go? <laughs> and then I wasn't a kinesiology major and then I switched the, to the school of art and then uh, yeah, the rest is history.
you know? well, now you mentioned you teach like digital art and yes. graphics, things like that. You, we, we all know how old we are right now. Yeah. You weren't doing that back then. What kind no, of art were you is, really into? This is funny. Well, so I started out as a graphic design major because when I, after I had uh, cashed in all my chips in that kinesiology class, my grade point average wasn't high enough to switch into the school of education. So I had to switch into the school of art, which had a lower requirement for GPA. So I spent a year and a half as a graphic design major before I could switch into the school of education, which housed art education. So don't, don't fail kinesi. Well, I didn't fail kinesiology. I got a D in kinesiology, but you know, D's are like failing if you go to the university, university of Wisconsin. You they know. say C's get degrees. I've never heard them say D's get degrees. So. And not many people <laughs> say that to the university of Wisconsin. Oh, I'll sure. tell you that right yeah. now. Yeah. So um, did you end up throwing there at UW? Well, I had the shortest throwing career in uh, Wisconsin college history, probably. Oh. I walked on. Um, so I was, uh, this is another side story. I don't know if you have time for all these side stories, Mike. Um, I was really into cycling. This is a weird, I was a weird hybrid. I volleyball. Yeah, you did track. every, what did you not do? Let's start there. <laughs> I don't know. Highlight. Wow. No, I didn't yeah. do highlight. Racket sports. You just no blew 99% of the listeners' minds. No one knows what highlight is unless you're down in Florida. Yeah, Miami. <laughs> Miami. Um. I was really into cycling. I spent a lot of time on my bike and mostly because I would lift all winter long to get ready for football season or for, uh, for track season. Sorry. I would lift all winter long to get ready for spring track to throw. And then I was the largest volleyball player. And in terms of like width and girth on my volleyball team, you know, all these tall, skinny basketball players, and so I would ride my bike all summer long, trying to lose some weight to oh. get ready for volleyball season the following year. So I would put like hundreds of miles on my, on my bike in the hmm. summer. Anyway, I had two friends who I grew up with playing baseball and kind of all of our sports. And uh, um, they were stepbrothers. And one of their fathers was um, my youth sport coach for most of my sports, baseball and basketball. And um, we had plotted, they were into cycling too, and we had plotted, we were going to defer, take a year off, and we were going to literally take our bikes around the United States. Like, Oh, man. From, from Wisconsin, we were going to dip into Chicago, go straight east to New York, um, get, go south before it started getting cold in New York, go across Texas, California, start going to Washington, you know, by the what time the it was getting world? warm again in the spring and then come back home by the end of the year and then start school a year later. And uh, so we had, we had done a lot of planning, like we did some mapping and we had done some reading about like how much money would it take to do this? And um, you know, how do you camp all those nights and all that kind of stuff. And it got time for me to like basically make my college decision. Like I had to like accept my dorm spot or not. And my parents kind of were like, you know, I don't know that we're comfortable with this whole bike idea. I know you've planned it, but are you really going to go through with it? And, you know, here's, you know, opportunity to go to University of Wisconsin, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I backed out of the bike trip. My two friends found a replacement, actually two replacements, and they went as a foursome, visited me in, in Madison eight months later in my dorm room, kind of at in like late May, almost right before finals, they had finished their, they, they did it. Yeah. About 6,000 miles or something no on their bike. Way. Yep. So I was not in the mindset that I was going to do track the following year. Wow. So I went into, you know, Ed Nuttycomb, one mm -hmm. of the most famous cross country Great. track and field yeah. coaches in the world. Legend. Uh, a legend. I went into his office and say, hey, my name's Joe Frontier. And I gave him my throwing stats from high school. And I'd love to have an opportunity. I don't know if you take walk-ons. And he said, sure, come on out. And so I walked on to the track team and uh, uh, I, I had spent the summer regretting not uh, going, you know, preparing for a bike trip. And I spent some time on my bike anyway. I was not in uh, the most strength oriented shape I've ever been in. So, you know, it, I was holding on for dear life for a few weeks and then I got mono. Oh, so it was man. about four weeks, I think, into kind of like fall, whatever track looked like then. I think we had maybe man. touched a shot put like one day. It was like, 
running hills and these crazy workouts and who, who was the throws coach um um it was that Napier. short of a career napier because he wasn't a throws coach so really? yes yeah, scott bennett was the throws coach the year before and he left and mark napier who was a multi coach yeah, so he's a great coach the, he's not what yeah. i would think is a throws coach but no maybe i think wrong. he was yeah. in charge of the throws so i think we were getting ah. in like the multi workout i didn't get very much throws oriented workout um yeah there was a brief brief stint and uh i got mono and i like dropped off the face of the earth for like two or three weeks like in my dorm room and by the time i got out of there i was like oh my gosh i'm so far behind in school and puppy mm. dog get back into ed nuttycomb's office and said you know uh i don't think i should be doing this i gotta get i gotta get caught up in the classroom and mm. so unfortunately you know and had there been you know not to throw napier under the bus but had there been a throws oriented coach and that first three weeks was different had i not gotten sick i probably would have continued but um uh as long as i could have I, you know, I wasn't about to quit but i just my hand was kind of forced in that situation but yeah you know i'm not someone who looks back on it and regrets it um I, uh, you know, I probably, I, it would have sent me on a different path and yeah, that's I've been right. pretty lucky with the path that I've been on. So, yeah, I tell people don't ever have regrets, good and bad things that you do or good or bad things that happen to you because, uh, exactly like you said there, it sets you on a path and you are a valued and great person right now. And who knows what would have happened if you'd have thrown for four years, you could have gotten seriously injured in those four years. You could have not met your wife because of throwing things like that. There's so many things that yeah. could have happened. So uh, it, it happened for a reason and it's a good reason that we're here today. It's awesome. I love that. So you go on and get your, you finally get into the education school <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and get, get art education. Now you've yep. been, you're at, um, uh, Gosh, I just hit a blank. I'm Madison so Memorial. Madison Memorial. Did you go straight to Madison Memorial to teach? Yep. So, um, right? you know, the, I guess to answer, you asked a question and I went off on a really long tangent. I apologize, Mike. Um, you know, did I know I wanted to be a teacher and a coach? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. My first year when I came back for spring break, uh, I went back home to my parents' house in Racine and my high school throws coach, coach Hammond asked, Hey, will you come to practice and demo for some of these young kids mm -hmm. stuff that he wasn't able to physically demo. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'd be honored. And so, you know, I don't know that I was a coach for a week, but you know, it was looking at it from a different perspective. I wasn't an athlete anymore. I was helping coach Hammond for one week. And, uh, that got me thinking like, I coaching would be cool. You, you kind of like that. And, huh? Yeah. And, um, so that was definitely a factor, e even though that was a little, you know, kind of a brief stint. And I think I actually did it my sophomore year as well. If I remember correctly, I went back and helped out another year. And then, um, yeah, so out of high school, I, or out of college, I got hired at Madison Memorial High School. And um, I don't know, about midway through the school year, I bumped into the guy who I heard was the throws coach. You know, I didn't know all the teachers there. And um Oh, why don't you come out and help out? You're interested in the throws and like, I love the throws, blah, blah, blah. And, um, at the end of the year, so I volunteered and I was there probably, I don't know, three or four days a week, my first year there. And he said, you know, you know, you're pretty passionate about this and I have, you know, other things I could be doing. He ended up being our head coach a few years later. Uh, he gave me the throws and he went over and coached sprints the next year. Hmm. And, um, and kind of the rest is history. That was 20 years ago. So I was going to say, how long now? 20 years. 20 years at Memorial. And um, yeah. And you, the, you've been the assistant coach. You've been the head coach. You're, you're now, you told me, thankfully, quote yeah, unquote, I, just the assistant coach, the throws Yeah, coach. I coached volleyball for the first 10 years um, that I was there as well. So I did 10 years of volleyball and track and was a head volleyball coach. And then decide as Madison Throws Club, which we could talk about too, um, started growing and expanding, volleyball seemed less and less, one, important to me, and two, track and field was taking up more and more of my year. And I just felt like, you know, I wasn't giving these, doing those kids service. My last year of volleyball, I was literally holding on for, for dear life in terms of my passion for it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was a head coach for volleyball. And then a year later, um, our head girls coach decided to leave. And all of a sudden I was the head track coach. And I was like, I wanted to be done with head coaching. I just wanted to focus on the throws year round. 
So I was a head track coach, I think, for four or five years, and uh, and then con my friend Drew Slumkis into doing it, and uh, he's been the girls' coach since then. So, so um, you've been happily an assistant coach again, and not the head coach. You've been there twenty years. Yep. What's it? What's the you know? So two thousand to two thousand twenty now. What is the difference between coaching? 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kids versus 20 years ago. Are they this, are they the same kids with different toys? What's, what's the difference that you've seen? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of things have changed about kids. I think a lot of things have changed about parents. So the kids are changing because parents are changing. Mm. Um, I think the sports landscape has changed in 20 years. And so youth, youth club, year round specialization, um, those kinds of things weren't really the vernacular or the, or the norm, um, when I first started coaching, you know, and, um, you know, you kind of coached kids for three months and then they would move on to their next thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, as that has changed, obviously I think it's allowed Madison throws club to change, um, in terms of like relationships with kids. I think kids are more distracted by some of the the things that exist in their lives. I think the social media part of it, you know, for good reasons and bad reasons, um, is a tug or is a tug on kids. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I see a lot more fragility in like mental health to the extreme, like where I see a lot more high school kids that are struggling with, you know, depression and self doubt and those kinds of things. But I think underneath that or not to that far down the spectrum of like mental health, I just think kids are more fragile in terms of, you know, them being concerned about, you know, what someone said about them, which I think is the norm for being an adolescent in our society forever. Mm -hmm. But now it's more, much more publicized. You know, if, if something, somebody says something nasty about you, when you or I were in middle school, someone said something nasty and three kids heard about it. And, you know, you punch someone in the arm and then you go get cheeseburgers later and you're over it. And, and now, you know, someone tweets or post something on their Instagram or whatever, something nasty. And, you know, a couple hundred people see it instead of it being kind of this localized just thing. And I think kids hmm. hold on to that information too tightly. And I think they disperse ill will too freely. Hmm. Um, I, I'm no psychologist and I, sure. so I, I shouldn't speak to those things. There are people who are certainly more knowledgeable in those areas. Yeah, these are just your observations. So what, yeah, I think so just at the, as a trend, I think I see that as, as a larger problem in kids' lives than it used to be in terms of their social status and their, their, their worry about how they're perceived. So that, that's really good insight. I mean, you don't have to be a psychologist to have uh, the experience that you've had over 20 years. I mean, you've seen so many different kids. I mean, kids that you coached in 2000 are now, are now parents themselves. And uh, maybe you're even coaching some of those kids, uh, parent, or some of those. I haven't had that athletes. happen yet, yet? but okay. I'm, my beard is getting gray enough to have that happen <laughs> it's, pretty soon. It's I coming think. soon. It's coming yeah, soon. Yeah, exactly. So with those changes that you've observed, uh, how do you find yourself coaching differently? And maybe not when I'm talking about that, not maybe the, the technical side, because You've, you've evolved as you've learned more about how to coach yeah. shot and disc, but how you are coaching the athlete, how do you find yourself working with them differently now than in 2000? I think some of the things I learned, you know, to go back to our discussion about my high school coach, some of the, the things that I learned from my high school coach, Bruce Hammond, are things that I think are critical, at least to my success. I don't want to say, hey, everyone should do how, coach how I coach. I think everyone needs to coach how they coach. But I think there's, uh, there's a compassion that's necessary to coach. Um, I think communication is key. Um, and I think uh, holding kids to incredibly high standards. You know, I think when I was younger, I was probably more worried about, like, do they like me? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, pretty quickly, I think coaches realize uh, the importance of or, or the, the fine line between them liking you and them respecting you. Um, and the power that if a, if a athlete respects you and you can say something and then follow it up and back it up and then, and show them that I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you with something. And then if you accomplish it, I'm going to give you the accolades you deserve for accomplishing that task. Mm. And I'm going to support you if you fail. And we're going to, we're going to turn that into 
a lesson and a motivation to overcome that the next time because I set that goal and you didn't get there. Um, how do you how do you turn around and deal with these kids who have these other pulls in their lives? Um, and for some of them, you know, at the high school level, you know, if you have them for two hours a day, how can you bring value to that two hours? And how can you get them to fall in love with this crazy sport that a lot of them have never had any interaction with until they get to the high school, um, which I think is very different compared to basketballs and baseballs and footballs where, you know, there's just a lot of youth opportunity for kids. Um, so how can we expose them to a positive experience and get them to fall in love with, uh, some of the things I said before, working hard, having fun while working hard, um, believing in themselves, turning, um, you know, things that didn't go their way into motivation so that, you know, they can go look at the measuring tape and see that they made progress the next time out. Um, I think, yeah. uh, I don't know that social media has changed that as in terms of, is it important? I think it's always been important. I think maybe it's more important now than it was then because a lot of times kids uh, will look at a coach and it might be the either oasis of the two hours away from all that social media crap Mm. or it turns into another negative and uh, it's not a distraction. And those are the kids that end up not doing track for very long. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I found it fascinating that as we were talking about what, how kids have changed in the past 20 years, the tenants that you rely on communication, passion, uh, teaching the, the love of hard work and, and that will beget results. Those are tenants that you were taught, you know, nearly 30 years ago. So as kids have changed, the important stuff maybe hasn't. No, I think it's like someone, you know, put a highlighter and, and drew over it and said, yeah, those were important 20 years ago when you started. And now maybe they're even more important. Um, you know, I think so, you know, as a coach, I'm using social media as a tool, especially right now while we're kind of coronavirus, you know, getting communicating with kids and Zoom meetings and reposting, you know, workouts on YouTube and um, reposting video that they're sending me on Instagram and trying to give them, hey, I'm so proud of you for, you know, doing this workout today. Uh, kudos, keep working, train safely, you know, all those things that, you know, we're, we're, we're having to adapt are coaching a little bit to the world that they're used to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so uh, maybe even more important today, uh, that yeah. idea of reflecting back, our kids do have some, some needs and sometimes social media is a way to scratch those itches. You know, as a high school coach, you have your own set of 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 kids, depending on which high school. 62 you this year I had for one week until we disband, we were disbanded. 62 throwers 60 at the high school I had 62 throwers the first week of track this year yeah oh, wow holy that's awesome by the way how big's this school 2100 so we had oh, about yeah, big, yeah. 290 kids out for track boys and girls and uh yeah six man 62 throwers dude for anybody who thinks track and field is dying hear that almost 300 kids out for the track team 2,100 students. So that's, uh, you know, my math, I went to school in Alabama. So what, 15%, right? <laughs> Good. right? Hey, I think that sounds right to me. I'm an art teacher. Right. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> we, whatever we say. We'll Anyone just, yeah. listening at home, don't, send, don't do the calculation and, and put it in the comments that we were wrong. You're talking about an art teacher and someone from Alabama. I love hearing that growth of track and field of that many kids and that many throwers, 60. Yeah, plus. my very Man. first year. So 20 years ago, I had 17 throwers. And uh, I think my third year, uh, it had gotten a little more popular. And I had 47. So that was a shocker to go up, like really changing, like what a practice looks like. Right. You know, yeah. How in, do you in do year, it? Yeah. You know, year one, year, year two to year three. And now I've probably been between like 40 and 50 for, I don't know, probably eight or 10 years. And so this year That's was awesome. an outlier. It was the biggest number I've ever had. That's so, well, then of course we got canceled. That, that, that yeah. just and, Murphy's and, yeah. Law. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So now it's one thing to have, 2030 you know 17 throwers I, honestly is that, that's impressive I've, I've been around track teams 17 a lot for throwers so whether you're working with 20 30 40 but now 
you actually are running this really successful uh, throws club. This fascinates me. Um, at Gill, I deal with and get to work with a lot of pole vault clubs, uh, clubs that specialize just in the pole vault. I uh, get to work with track clubs. So there's a throwing component, jumping component, etc. Uh, but there's not too many throw specific clubs out there. Talk to me about how that got started and what's it look sure. like today. So um, my, after my volunteer year, so let, I'm just trying to do the math on yours, 2002. In 2002, uh, the WIA, uh, our high school sports association, uh, changed the rules and allowed track and field to have basically unlimited contact in the summer with their athletes, which used to have a lot of restrictions and there's still a lot of sports that have a lot of restrictions like football. You can have five contact days in the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of people have been clamoring for this mostly because there aren't a lot of certified pole vault coaches or, mm -hmm. you know, there's not, a, there wasn't 20 years ago, much access for kids to learn the sport. Whereas there's a lot of football camps and there's a lot of basketball camps. Oh, right. mm -hmm. So the restrictions I think needed to get changed. And so, um, that first year that I was the coach, uh, I had some some young throwers who were successful, and uh, one of them, um, well, I'll talk about two of them were really important. Um, Larry Airhorn was a sophomore, um, and Jenna Mahaffey was a junior. And Jenna had come out her junior year after playing two years of soccer. I had her in a study hall, and I said, "What do you do in the spring? You should be a thrower." And she's like, "Throw what?" Um, she ended up not playing soccer junior year and she came in eighth place at the state meet her first year out. Wow. And uh, Larry wasn't quite there yet. He was a sophomore and that kind of transitioned the 12 pound ball. And, you know, I was, it was the first year I was the coach. So things were different. It was a big transition year. And then WI changed these rules. I said, Hey, you guys want to throw this summer? And they're like, yeah. So we threw all summer long. I was young. I was a bachelor. You know, I had plenty of time. I lived, <laughs> I, I lived on the like other side of our pole vault pit. There's a fence. And then I lived in a condo, like literally on the other oh, side wow. of yeah. the fence. So we threw all summer long. Uh, Larry just missed the state meet as a junior to some really kind of some senior studs in our sectional. And Jenna ended up winning the state shot put championship that, that second year. Um, the following year, Larry as a senior was leading the state meet and then ended up coming in second place by four inches to the eventual state record holder, Steve Marcel, um, who, you know, blew, blew, uh, you know, 30 year old shot put record away. So all of a sudden I had these kids who were really passionate and we were throwing all summer long and they turned out, you know, they, they ended up getting much better, you know, right. you take anyone who's passionate about something and train them for five months instead of three, mm -hmm. they're going to get better. And um, all of a sudden kids from these, the, the conference schools, not my school were asked like, what are you doing over there? It looks very different at Memorial high school. Will you coach us this summer? And um, Luke Sullivan, uh, who is the state record holder in the discus and was an all American at UCLA under Art Venegas um, had, finished his college in, uh, at UCLA and had moved back to the Madison area. And so we kind of combined forces and let's give this summer thing that we're doing a name and we made and turned out to be Madison Throws Club. And the first summer, I think we had, you know, first summer after kind of was just Jenna and Larry. Um, I think we had 10 or 12 kids and, you know, Luke and I coached them up all summer long. We had a blast doing it. Those kids had a lot of success the next year at the state meet. Um, Luke ended up moving back out west to, to arizona to train with dave dumble to prepare for the next round of olympic trials 2008 um and i continued the club and uh, got some other high school coaches who were super successful um or i deem like hey i could learn something from this this person and my kids could benefit from having some other coaches here and it just kind of kept growing and uh we started having fall sessions and winter sessions and you know now there's I don't know, somewhere in the vicinity of probably 150 or so kids that at some point come to Madison Throws Club for maybe a one day clinic. Mm -hmm. um, but basically we'll run like two back to back 30 kid sessions all summer long. So about 60 kids who are there. I'm, I'm all, hearing a lot of time. a lot of training, which is, is awesome. It's the most important part, in, in my yeah. opinion, because 
you can't train and do it right, you can't compete on Saturday. Uh, are, are you doing during those summers? Are you doing AAU and USATF meets as well, or is this just training so, to get ready for next high school? That's the funny thing is that um, this was an interesting thing. The idea behind it was let's get these kids better at shot and discus. You know that that was pure and simple. The only idea that behind the whole thing, let's train. And I think because the residual of, you know, let's take these two kids that are Memorial kids and now I can coach you all summer long. Let's, let's get these kids better for next year. I just kind of went in the next year as these other kids started coming in to the club, let's get better for next year. And I wasn't really focused on USATF or AAU or any of those kind of summer circuity meets. Mm. Um, at this point I was coaching volleyball and the club structure of volleyball had really kind of grown into a, a ugly multi-headed animal. That, that is a whole different ball game club. Volleyball. And, you know, I was a volleyball coach and I'm, I'm looking at like, I'm in one of the most competitive conferences, you know, coaching volleyball here. And if I'm not telling my kids that they need to play club, we're going to get our butts whooped by all these other teams that are embracing club. So I say, you got to, you know, you got to play club. And I coached one year of club volleyball and, you know, was very appreciative. Those people were super passionate about volleyball and, but the pure suck of like family resources, the, the financial commitment they were asking kids to make for this volleyball training the number of tournaments and travel involved. And I, you could extrapolate this and push it towards any club sport, but the, Hey, we're going to start practices all winter at five o'clock. And that means you can't play basketball at your high school. If you wanted to play basketball, because you got to be committed to this club thing that you tried out for and made. And it's a really big deal that you made it all of those things. Well, I think started out as kind of a pure and good thought in terms of like growing the sport of volleyball have turned into a monster. Mm -hmm. And I watched a lot of kids who were volleyball athletes burn out and like start hating volleyball by their senior year or kids leave the high school and Hey, you know, I played club and I got this opportunity to play in college and they were quitting their after their sophomore year of college. Like they had run out of wow. fuel for volleyball. And so the, I definitely probably took that into consideration as I kind of structured what the goals were for Madison Throws Club. And I really kept it about, you want to get better at shot putting discus? I would love to teach you what I know. I'd love to bring in other coaches who are passionate about it as well and let them share what they've learned about shot putting discus. And if you want to go to some of these meets, you know, you can sign up for USATF. You know, we were a USATF club, but I wasn't traveling with kids. I wasn't signing them up for the, you know, Wisconsin USATF meet to qualify for regionals. And I had many kids who wanted to do that, but I let that be a parent thing and a family thing. And if you want to go on vacation to Nebraska to go to the regional meet, you should go on vacation of Nebraska for the regional meet. Mm. Um, but my focus always was just get kids better. And my kind of, my, my measuring stick was always how far are they throwing? Are they getting better from when they can't got to throws club? And how did they do the next high school season was kind of the model that I have always used. Is that still and, hold true today as far as the summer meets and stuff? Yeah. You know, and I've had some, you know, incredibly, I've been very blessed with some incredible athletes who have, you know, gone on to do really good things and represent the United States at the world youth championships and, and, you know, Pan Am juniors and knack acts. And, you know, after they leave high school, um, all sorts of things like that. And all of those were kind of, Hey, that athlete, that's their path. And, um, I'm supporting and I'm rooting for you and I'm hitting, you know, the, the, you know, update bar refresh, on the results yeah. on the, yeah, refresh, refresh, <laughs> refresh, and trying to find live video somewhere. Um, you know, and bonus, Oh, if someone's doing Instagram live video. Excellent. I can watch the junior junior championships. Uh, fantastic. That's, that's um, really refreshing, Joe. You know, it's, I, I see, um, I, I don't want to say a lot, but I see some club coaches uh, throughout the country that it's very much about how many regional qualifiers can they get, how many national qualifiers they can have and champions and things like that. Uh, there's always this debate about how, as a high school 
track coach, how do you work with or don't work with the summer uh, track club coach? So it's really refreshing that you're um, it's, it's really a club in the sense of like the old school definition of club of like, okay, a bunch of like-minded people are going to get together to participate in something that they all have in common, which in this case is throwing, not about this organization of let's go see how many ribbons and medals and records and uh, points we can score as a, as a team. In that sense. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a competitive person, so don't get me wrong. Like oh. I really cherish kids being successful at what we're, we're trying to teach them. But um, yeah, I just was never really motivated by the USATF tally and not to discredit USATF or people who want to participate in that. It's a great, Hey, I want to find out how, what the measuring stick is in June. And I want to check what the measuring stick in, is in July. Um, for me, you know, it's been about like the accumulation of reps, you know, give me a mediocre, athlete who is passionate about it and about getting better at this particular set of of disciplines shot put and discus or hammer or, uh, i try not to coach the javelin but i do have some madison throws club staff members who coach coach the jab um you know how can i get them enough reps so that they can get as good as possible at maximizing what their body is capable of doing so that they continue to get better and a lot of times those kids who put the time in and the reps in get better than the kids who are, you know, maybe physically more gifted than them. And certainly when a physically gifted come, kid comes along, they have incredible success when they put the time and the, the reps in. Um, from an accolade standpoint, because, you know, I'm, I'm tallying like state championships, you know, it's a collaboration. And one, there's a lot of camaraderie. I think track and field has that in spades all across the board. I think throwing, the throwing community is incredible. The coaches that I get to work with or even the coaches that I coach against, you know, we're leaning in and sharing ideas or, oh, my gosh, your kid's gotten so much better since the last time I saw them. You know, what are you doing in the weight room with them? He looks a lot stronger this year. You know, boy, has she really gotten better at that part of her throw? You know, this idea that we're standing next to each other, we're trying to beat each other. But, um, you know, and, and the second part of that is, um you know, when I list the accolades of these athletes, one, I'm trying to give them the credit for it. Um, and I don't want to sound, you know, so altruistic and righteous, but, you know, I'm not a fool to recognize that, you know, really what I am is, uh, is a collaborator with their high school coach. Um, these kids who are winning state championships might be training with me, you know, two or three days a week in the summer and, and every weekend in the fall and every weekend in the winter. And maybe they're an online client. I'm giving them feedback on their video analysis or sending them workouts or whatever. But that kid is also going to their practice and working with their coach five or six days a week in March and April and, and, and May. And so, you know, when I, you know, post, Hey, somebody won a state championship, um, you know, it's a, it's, they won that state championship and, you know, I, I feel blessed that I was able to contribute to it. Um, but, you know, we're sharing a lot of these athletes, uh, Dave Ostrowskis, who's the UW throws coach, Dave and I have been friends for a long time. And um, he always shakes his head. He's like, I don't know how you get away with this, this, you know, like what, why, why didn't some coach just come up and punch you, you know, in the face. And I don't know, I try to usually be, I'm, I'm probably nice to a fault, but also, um, I hope that, you know, every coach that I've ever worked with a kid realizes that I'm trying to just send that kid back to them better than they started with. And, you know, the ultimate arrangement is, you know, the, the, the high school rules in Wisconsin still exist that I can't coach my own kids, you know, when the school year starts until March, whatever the start of track. So I can coach my kid all March and all April and all May. And now I can coach them all summer too, because WI relaxed those rules 19 years ago. But come September, I can't coach my kid. And so another kid who wants to throw, they can't go to their coach and ask them. And so I, Madison Throws Club is here and I'm going to help that kid. And when March starts and their coaches can start working with them, hopefully they were better than the last time they saw them. And uh, that's the mission. And uh, you know, the one knock sometimes I get, well, what about, you know, you're getting kids from other schools better. They're going to beat your kids. And, you know, to me, it comes down to, well, my kid gets me every single day in March, April and June or in May. 
So if your kid beats me, then I'm getting out coached or that kid's more talented. Uh, and I also think steel, steel sharpens steel. You know, the fact that uh, there's the hopefully Madison Throws Club and these kids that are committed to working, you know, more than just the three month track season are better. The bar is getting raised. And that means other kids recognize, oh my gosh, that person threw that far. I'm going to have to work that much harder to mm-hmm. be able to compete with that person. Yeah, we, and, we, we, uh, we're quick to talk about are you just coaching other kids to beat your kids and things like that? And we forget that that great point you made there about steel sharpened steel that, well, maybe me and my kids wouldn't be as good if I didn't have those other kids working together and pushing each other and, and, uh, uh, and sharpening each other's skill set and motivating each other. So yeah, we forget to talk about that point that the overall bar could be lower if I didn't have that aspect there. Yeah. And I think there's been something that's really happened that, you know, in the, in the game plan of 2003, you know, throws club, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a crystal ball. Um, You know, last year throws club girls swept the top eight spots in the division one discus. And those girls all know each other from throws club. Mm. All they choose to be in the same circle at throws club. We're at the state meeting, they're all wearing different colored uniforms and every single one of them knows each other's PRs <laughs> and they're all rooting for each other. They're, you know, someone makes this, you know, someone scratches a throw and that person comes out of the, the circle and, you know, three, four other girls are, are, you know, grabbing them and say, you know, you got this on the next throw. And that is something I never could have foreseen happening, the kind of culture shift that these kids mm-hmm. are creating for each other. I've watched, you know, nervous kids at the state meet, you know, get unnervous from kind of the, the, I'm not just here and it's just my coach and I got to go do my warm up. And all of a sudden some other throws club kid who also made it to state and they don't have a teammate there, but they're throws club people grab them and they go do their warm up before the third flight starts together. And they're out there kind of loosening each other up and distracting them and it starts feeling like oh I'm just at throws club just going to go out there and practice like it's any other day and all of a sudden they produce fantastic results rather than being nervous on the biggest stage and uh, that's pretty special when that happens. You know we see that and hear that quote unquote all the time in the pole vault world that you know they're not competing against each other they're competing against the bar. The bar. So when, when one of their uh, one of the athletes does well they're all really congratulatory I, I still think of Sam Kendrick's setting the record at Drake this, this, uh, past, past summer. I, you know, I lose track. I don't even know what day it is anymore now. Uh, but last year or two years ago and all of his competitors rushed the pit to mob and congratulate him. And it's like, those are all yeah. the second, third and fourth, fifth placers. But in that moment, they've all hit this big deal of, of beating that bar. They, they hit the record. So I, we don't see that very often in throws partly because we don't have as many uh, throws clubs as we do as pole vault. We don't see that because the throws aren't ever on TV, Mike. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a great point. And, <laughs> and one that should be changed. Uh, uh, absolutely. I, I agree well, with that. Last year at our state meet, uh, and not to name drop high school kids, because there's so many kids I would love to throw some shine at, but uh, one of my throws from Madison Memorial High School uh, matches her PR, I think, in round five of state girls shot put takes the lead in the women in the girls shot and um, Riette Thorne's great, amazing kid. She's going to throw at Grand Valley state university next year for Matt Conley. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Danny Langseth, a girl, a throws club athlete from DC Everest high school, great coach, Chad Brecky up there. She gets in the circle PRs by two and a half feet on her last throw and she wins the shot. put. yeah, I mean, it was, it was amazing. And so Riette's bummed she didn't win and she's equally happy for Danny because they're like circle mates at throws club year round. And, um, you know, to see that and, you know, see them to, you know, take pictures together and afterwards and, and be excited for each other. Yeah. Then the very next day, um, you know, Danny throws a big throw in the discus and I th- Riette, I think was recording the discus for me because I'm over there coaching another girl from my high school who made it the discus came in fourth Cynthia uh, Rosales and Danny has a big throw and you know you can hear Riette in the video like just going absolutely bonkers for Danny the girl beat her yesterday you know on her last throw in the shot put and 
you know, those are things, those are things that kids are going to take with them for a long time is remembering kind of the camaraderie when 20 years from now, the, the, the inches don't, they don't remember the inches from their throw or the, what color their metal was necessarily, but they remember their experiences. The experience. That's and it. there's a ton of value in that. And, um, you know, it's hard to put that in perspective when you're 18 and to see some of these kids put it into context in the moment, let alone, you know, it's much easier when you're 25 or 30 to look back on and say, oh my gosh, that was so cool. Yeah. Well, that, um, but to you see know, them they'll do it appreciate time, that though. Yeah, they will, sure. they will get there. You know, I tell you what I'm really proud to hear from you, Joe, and just it's, it, it really is awesome. I, I didn't expect to talk about this aspect, but one of the things I was thinking about when you're talking about summer and how you don't uh, focus or do the meets and things like that. It's more about the kids getting better. And if, you know, if they go to their own path to do AUs or USATF, that's great. What you're just, what you're describing there to go back to our psych, our psychology <laughs> roots that we were our, talking about. Our, our area of total expertise, expertise. everyone listening, what that's Mike right. and I are about to say is absolutely the Bible. Psychology and math. That's the two things you're going to learn in today's <laughs> episode. Uh, but what you're talking about there is intrinsic versus extrinsic values and, and uh, award system there. And so it seems like you're building, you, you touched on this word, the culture that it's about self-improvement, not about where you line up first, second, third, gold, silver, bronze. Did you improve today? Did you improve this month? Did you improve this season? Uh, that's the kind of culture that, you know, these kids, the, the best slogan logo that the NCAA has ever come up with is we're all going to go pro in something because it's, it ain't yeah. going to be track. You know, it's very, very yeah. few people that go pro and track, but these kids are all going to become doctors, lawyers, business owners, coaches, teachers, etc. So you're imparting that culture that it ain't about who you beat and how you, it's, it's about what do you do? Are you being the best nurse today? Are you being the best bus driver today? Are you being the best father, mother, brother, sister today? that is what you're really teaching there. So I love that. That just, that, that's the best part of the podcast for me is hearing how you focus on that. I love that. I'll take it one step further and just kind of expose one of my, one of my hardest coaching lessons I've ever learned. You know, okay. I have learned, I have learned so much from other coaches. I pride myself on, you know, I'm going to go to this conference. I'm going to, you know, buy this book. I'm going to watch this. I'm going to go, you know, do this webinar. I'm going to go get this certification. I'm seeking knowledge constantly um, and I'm indebted to the coaches that I've borrowed this drill from or overheard this and all that, but I've learned more from my kids than I've learned from any coach wow. ever. Um, when I think about, uh, there was a season 2003, 2004, 2004. So see Jenna Mahaffey, who's now Jenna Pocky, um, won the state championship in 2003 and the very next year I had two other girls qualify for state in the shot put and this is the year Larry Airhorn uh, was the runner up in the shot put and um, those girls had an incredible season so it was like this continuation of like Jenna had figured it out and then I had uh, Lindsay Tauber, Kelly Martinson, um, some fantastic throwers and this was the year that my group had grown to 47. <laughs> so I come out from having, you know, state champion, state runner up, multiple qualifiers, and they all had graduated. And the very next year, the next seven best girls returning didn't come back out for track. And wow. it was a real like look in the mirror moment of like, you know, I was a young, young coach. I was, I was learning and figuring things out on the run, but all of a sudden it's like, you know, you better start valuing the fact that some girl went from 29 feet to 30 feet. And that was a big barrier. And that was really important to her as much as you value the girl who threw 43 feet and won the conference meet. Mm -hmm. And as soon as, you know, you have kids say you were too focused on other kids and, and they didn't tell me that, but that's what I discerned is that those seven kids didn't get the same value or experience or, or fall in love with track or feel that I was giving them the support that they needed to fall in love with it. Uh, it really changed my perspective as a coach mm. of what is motivating these kids. Cause not every kid is going to be able to be a state champion. 
not every kid is going to win conference. Not every kid is going to compete for a varsity letter. And when you have 62 kids, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of kids that'll teach you the worst way to throw the shot put over the kids that actually are good exemplars of how to throw the shot put. So there's a lot of kids out there who are seeking something else besides a medal. And as soon as we as coaches can help kids find value in the work necessary it is to get better and whether they're better is, you know, six inches better at a JV meet and, 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 and giving kids kudos for that and, and finding like, that is amazing. I can't believe how far you've grown. That was a big accomplishment. Um, all of a sudden then kids start seeing the big picture, but sometimes it takes the coach to learn that lesson before. Um, you can provide those opportunities for kids without pissing them off first and, and then them moving on to something different. Yeah, they'll make a bad tweet about you or something nowadays. Yeah, they, they didn't have the power of Twitter back then, but I'm sure <laughs> I would have. Uh, you know, that was a real like, you know, holy shit, the, you know, that first week of the following season and I yeah. start seeing these kids who signed up and I go and ask, hey, are you coming out? I'm really excited about this season. And they're like, no, I'm not coming out. Why not? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't really like it, I, you know. I'm like, holy crap, what, you know, you start assessing what did you do wrong and how can I do it better? Wow. That, that's the stories I want to tell right there. You know, we hold to such high esteem the coaches that coach a state champion or the, and to your point, the athlete that wins a state champion. Uh, you know, I coached for 10 years and I still tell the story of this JV miler that I coached high school up in Chicago, had run 630 in the mile all year at the JV Catholic League meet, break six, runs 559. We celebrated his parents, me and him, as if he won the, the gold medal, not just the state championship. Yeah. Super and Bowl. I, he just won the Super Bowl. Yeah. That is, that was, oh my gosh, that was 20 plus years ago. And I still, Robert Threat, I will always remember that man, that boy then, he's a man now. I don't know what he does now. Uh, that will always, in my brain, like we were so happy. And he ran 5.59. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, oh, man. So you've done so much, Joe. I, I started thinking about this as you were telling me those, that, 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 that lesson that you learned. And I'm so glad, honestly, that you learned it because uh, it's really affected you positively and therefore affected a lot of athletes and uh, their networks and parents uh, positively. It's still hard to do. I think the tricky part about track is, you know, when you're the throws coach, you're the varsity JV freshman, you're the developmental coach, you're the you know, you're the everything coach where other sports, you know, uh, in, in general, if you're the varsity basketball coach, those kids are all on a similar journey. Mm -hmm. If you're the, the JV coach, you know, those kids are on a journey. You coach the freshmen, they're on a similar journey. And so, you know, you can get lost in the fact that when you're all these kids coaches and, you know, the kids are, you know, two kids are going to the invite this weekend and the rest mm -hmm. aren't going, it's hard to not focus on, Hey, are these kids ready for the invite on Saturday? Um, and sometimes kids get lost in the, in the mix of that. So as I'm hearing all this and learning about your journey through athletics and coaching, and I so appreciate if you would share with us today, that journey, uh, the question I get a lot of times, especially when I used to teach uh, USATF level ones. And when I was a college coach myself, I get a lot of high school coaches that would ask me, Hey, how do I coach in the college level? You've obviously been amazingly successful you're very personable uh passion through the roof uh did you ever consider coaching college you know not not really um to say i didn't haven't like thought about it you know i've seen some of the like division three wisconsin schools have openings in my 20 years a lot of those you know jobs have changed um and there's a really rich tradition at the division three level in Wisconsin, Amazing. But, um, you know, and I've learned a lot from some of those coaches. I think about, you know, I've learned a lot about like the hammer throw, which I never did as an athlete from Pat Ebel when he was coaching at Oshkosh and now he's yeah. at Auburn. Love that. Guy. Um, learned a ton from like Dave Hahn and his years at UW Whitewater. Um, some of these great, great coaches. And you look at like the UW lacrosses, Eau Claire's and Stouts and um, Stevens point, what those coaches are doing is really cool. Um, and you know, for me, I, when I boil it down, it would be really hard for me to leave my classroom. And as much as throws kind of consumes my, my mind outside of like my family, um, 
I really do love teaching art. And so, um, and maybe I'm just too old for that much cha to consider changing, you know, that much of a shift. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think in Wisconsin, inevitably, um, uh, that would mean I would have to move my family and things like that. Uh, the, the rat race of college coaching it scares me when I see, um, you know, and I think we're in an interesting time to be specific about it right now as budgets tighten across the country post whatever happens here um i can see the you know this coach moves and then the carousel starts spinning of like where are all these people going to land and there's just uh, a lot of uncertainty in that world and uh i'm someone who uh, has learned to appreciate uh the things that i can control and uh uh, I probably have a healthy fear of the things that I wouldn't be able to control in that situation. <laughs> well, no doubt uh, you would have done an amazing job there as well. Cause again, that passion and, uh, and the knowledge and uh, just the personality, I could see you just being an amazing recruiter. I could see you just, you know, 18 year old kids just being attracted to coming to be uh, an athlete under your tutelage. So uh, I that's no nice doubt. of you to say, Mike, I appreciate yeah, that. Good. It's fun to, you know, one of the things I've been really lucky enough to do is, you know, there's, I think last year there were 47 Madison Throws Club alumni throwing at some college in the United States. Wow. And um, it's fun to hand these kids off, you know, to like, you know, we, we, we figured out a whole bunch of stuff and now go and learn from this person who has a different take on it, knows more than me, does it differently than I do. And, you know, that's going to broaden your horizon. And so I, I love watching college coaches do what they do. And I love seeing my kids move on from, you know, the high school experience and, and um, get rolled into a new environment and learn new things. And so um, I get there's a lot of gratification that comes from these kids moving on. I, I guess I can't even fathom what it would be like on the other end of the spectrum. Well, no doubt the college coaches that have your kids are pleased with the uh, the base that you've given them. You give them a kid who uh, has a lot of technical knowledge and passion for their sports. I'm sure they're very, very thankful. I'll have to ask uh, Ostrowskis about that. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> uh, as we wrap up tonight, um, I really want to talk about this podcast i uh, i don't know if you know i have a passion for podcast hey, hey. <laughs> uh, and i'm looking through your last few episodes here so i love the, the niche that you're in you do a podcast about throwing what what a surprise shocker yeah and the last couple of guests can I'm, my next about? podcast is going to be about math my yeah, and and math and psychology <laughs> math and psychology you're you'll be my first guest it's my it's going to be my next side it's a side hustle i'm working on Oh, I see. So you like to start over. You've got such a great audience. <laughs> you want to just crash uh, and see if you can build it back up. But no, listen, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Listen to these guests you've had, my man. Kibway Johnson. This is just the last few. Ryan Whiting. Maggie. I'm going to, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Ewan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a great, I met her at the NCAAs one year, a few years ago. What a super nice person she is. Uh, Tyler Rafke. Great guy. I love him. Uh, Nick Garcia, who maybe is the West Coast Joe Frontier. I don't know. I'll have to uh, get him on the podcast one day. You should. Uh, he's a great, he's a great, he's, he's a great chat, man. He's great. He's resourceful. He's passionate. I love, love that guy. Uh, Josh Cinemo, a Paralympian. Uh, you've had Ryan Whiting on here a couple of times. I think Ryan's angling for something here. Kelsey Card. Come on, man. Uh, how, so in, you're on episode 47. You've been doing this for a while. How did you start? You started podcasting before I did for crying out loud. How did you get into it? And what led you to maybe start a podcast? Well, I, uh, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw some stones at the basketball coach at Madison Memorial high school. His name is Steve Collins. Um, Steve is, uh, we're probably two out of the three oldest coaches or most tenured coaches at our high school. And he's had a lot of success. He had a run where he was, uh, they, the boys basketball team made it to state nine years in a row and had won three championships in Wisconsin. And they've been back to the state tournament, you know, multiple times. I think they won like 16 conference championships in a row, something ridiculous. Wow. And uh, he started a basketball con um, podcast. He actually has three podcasts. His kids are older than mine. I don't know how he actually, when he sleeps. Um, and so um, he's like, Joe, you should do a podcast about the throws. I have, I have three different ones. Two of them are about basketball. 
Um, and I'm like, wait a second. Uh, so anyway, I listed a couple episodes of his show and I was like, this would be, he's like, what? I said, what's, what's your angle? He's like, I just like talking about basketball. And he's like, well, I, I can't think of anything more than I like talking about throws. Um, and Dave Ostrowskis, I'll bring up Dave Ostrowskis again, because Dave and I hang out, we're, we're good friends. And he's, he's been, great at, guy. he's been I at UW him. for 11 years. You know, he's, uh, uh, has it really throw, been 11 years? Yeah. 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 It feels 2000, like 2009, I think was his first year. Three, four, five years ago, he was down in Edwardsville. Just a, just a minute ago. That was a minute oh, ago. Oh, wow. Man, that and means he, I'm getting old, basically. Yeah. So anyway, his wife is the volleyball coach at Ripon College. That's right. And I co- used to coach volleyball. My wife coached volleyball for years. And so um, our, we have a lot of in common. So the, the four of us hang out from time to time. And Dave, well, there are a lot of throws coaches out there in the country who love the throws. And Dave is one of them. He loves the throws. He's very good at what he does. The last thing he wants to talk about on a Saturday is throws, right? Because that is his job, you know, 50, <laughs> 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Right. My job is 50 hours of art. And all I want to think about the other hours is throws. And so sometimes Dave just looks at him and he's like, Joe, stop talking about the throws. <laughs> so the podcast is my outlet to talk about the throws and not annoy Dave Ostrowskis. And now, was, the funny was, thing is, was Dave, is your Dave, first is guest? Not, Dave has not been a guest on the podcast yet. Oh! <laughs> I thought that was going to be the number one. Who, who was no, first? No, no, no. So um, just wait till I retell that exact same story as the introduction to whenever Dave does submit yes. to being on the podcast. Yes. Um, so anyway, uh, long story short, or that was too long, so I, I can't save myself and make it shorter. But I want to talk about the throws, and yeah. and um, there's also a little piece of the fact that. I do so much coaching year round, 12 months out of the year throws club has become this kind of year round thing. I try to take, try to take the month of August off. Um, and I try not to coach in August as kind of a family sanity thing and preparation for the next school year and be a, be a half decent teacher. Um, but I live in my own echo chamber a lot. I hear myself coach a lot. Um, I do go to a ton of clinics and conferences and try to continue to push myself and learn. Um, but I thought, Hey, I can ask the exact questions I want to hear the answers to if I get people to say yes to being on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it's grown, you know, the fact that, you know, Tom Walsh said yes. And Danny Stevens has said yes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, talking with Ashley Kovacs after the world championships, um, uh, you know, those, those conversations um, have helped me as a coach. And so often, um, you know, I'm thinking about a response I get from, you know, a pro athlete who, you know, Kelsey Card in particular recently, I just felt like, oh my gosh, so many of my kids need to hear that here's a, here's, here's a woman who's made the Olympics and the discus and, you know, holds multiple Big Ten records when she left Wisconsin. And she's thinking about this, or she doubts this, or, you know, and so high school kids can be like, you need to listen to this episode you're going to get inspired to hear that, you know, pro athletes feel this way, you know, they have struggles. This is how they get over those situations. Oh, you scratched all three throws at a meet. So, and so did so-and-so and they're a world champion. And here's how they, you know, went back and approached the next, the next, uh, the next opportunity to recover from that happenstance. And so um, it's twofold. One, I do it for myself because I want to have, you know, scratch the itch of talking about throws. And two, I want to continue to learn, but also have kids be able to learn from some of these conversations as well. What I love about it is I have looked through the episodes, and and by the way, we haven't mentioned the name of the podcast, Throw Big, Throw Far. Uh, You got to go subscribe right now to the Throw Big, Throw Far podcast. You'll, You'll definitely enjoy it. Even if, so obviously, Joe, we're talking about, you know, these throwers that you've been talking to and, uh, you know, you are just throw, throw, throw on your brain. Uh, But there seems to be some pretty good episodes here. If I'm just a track coach in general, I see you did a kind of a two-parter uh, about Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Dyring, yeah. Uh, no, no, uh, Bonderchuk. I oh, understand. yep. Yeah. Dr. B, sure. Yeah, Dr. B, you know, transfer of training and uh, traditional training. That That is applicable to the speed and power, whether you're a thrower, a sprinter, etc. I saw, uh, oh, uh, the one I saw that I really wanted to make sure I pointed out was, uh, you mentioned, um, gosh. I Chris Eyring, I, I would say if you're a track coach yeah. and not a throws coach, 
Um, those two episodes are amazing. Chris Eyring, Dr. Chris Eyring is a sports psychologist. Uh, she actually was a track athlete, a sprinter at UW. I think she might still hold one of the UW records. Um, but uh, there's two episodes in there. We talk about like um, performance anxiety, which is something she you know, deals with hundreds of athletes in terms of how to compartmentalize the stress of performance. And then the other one kind of championship mentality, developing this mindset that, you know, you're going to be able to do what you are capable of doing when you want to do it the most. And, uh, you know, those are things that have to do with the throws, but those are things that I think um, any athlete and any, any track coach or any coach for that matter could benefit. So I do try to kind of get out of the throwing world, um, mm-hmm. but still have some connected tissue to kind of the heartbeat of, of what it is that I'm crazy about. Yeah, even episode 28, Ashley Kovacs, uh, talking about transitioning from being a thrower to being a coach, and she did it at a high level, all-American thrower, to a world champion coach. That would definitely interest any uh, coach in general, but a, an athlete out there who's like, man, how do I become, that's great, I was a, an athlete, but now I'm trying to become this great coach. How do, how is, how have other people uh, gone through that? So yeah, see these other- Susie, Susie Powell talks a little bit, I mean, we talk a lot about Susie Powell's discus dominance in the United States for years and years and years. And I was a big Susie Powell fan. Um, and we talk obviously about her career. Um, but now she's coaching at a junior college and she's coaching, you know, these, you know, not the thoroughbred athletes and she's mm-hmm. figuring out, you know, how do I maximize what I can get out of these kids? And, uh, to hear someone, you know, who has been at the height of our sport, right. um, you know, and translate to, you know, coaching, I think that has a lot of application for a lot of people. I'm scrolling down now to find out uh, you were your first guest. <laughs> yeah. The first episode. Yeah. Well, that's not true. My first guest was in the next show and it was yeah, Luke, Luke Sullivan. Right. Yeah. Um, so oh, look who your third guest was. Good John friend. Gadina. Yeah, John I, Gadina. Love John. Yeah. So John and I go back a ways and I had gone to some uh, of the educational stuff he was doing before Altus mm-hmm. was Altus and it was mm-hmm. world throws center. And so, uh, and he was a teammate of Luke Sullivan's. And so, right. um, you know, a sense. lot of the, you know, connective tissue of, of the people, you know, the people, you know, and the people that you network with and the people you ask questions to, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm emailing back and forth with John about a question I had based on a clinic that I'd gone to five or six years ago. And I had a thought that he had brought up and I wanted to hear him flesh it out. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Hey, you want to be on the podcast sometime? And you know, and then John Gadeen was on the podcast. Dude, that's a, that reminds me, I've got to get John on. Uh, I became friends with John through Gill Athletics and really was humbling. You know, I, uh, while I coached, you know, I coached the SEC, so I got to coach at a fairly high level. You know, I was, I'm, I was nobody. I got out after 10 years and now to call myself and, and I think he would reciprocate, uh, John, a friend of John Gadeen's. I mean, he is just one of the nicest beyond his athletic career which was amazing he's one of the nicest and smartest people i have ever met that dude is is amazing i'll have to get him on the uh podcast just so i can embarrass him about a story about him and my my kid my, my little boy uh and embarrass meaning john is like the most thoughtful person in, in the whole world so uh, that's cool that awesome man so, yeah, it's fun yeah. to see how altus has has evolved into what it's become oh yeah he did a fantastic job with that and now he's moved on to some other activities and I have no doubt those are going to be as successful and, and more. So he's, he just continues to learn. He's one of those guys that just continues to learn and, and uh, puts those lessons into application for anything that he sets his mind to. So definitely if you're listening right now, uh, I know you are subscribed to the Gelfetics connections podcast, but you have to go and subscribe right now to the throw big throw far podcast hosted by today's guest, Joe frontier. Uh, Joe, man, uh, I just can't say thank you enough. Uh, I'm really, um, you know, coming for me, this may not mean much, but I, I, I pulled the weight of Gill Athletics with me when I say this. This is the truth. Uh, you know, so proud of what you do for uh, not just athletes, but other coaches around. Your, your selflessness in teaching those intrinsic values versus the if you ain't first, you last mentality that we have in there in, in some sports and some coaches. 
uh, really makes society better and you're doing it through this great sport of track and field and even more specifically these great events of shot and discus uh, and, and not so much javelin. Uh, <laughs> so Joe just can't say thank you enough for being here and sharing your story today. Uh, I had a blast man so thankful. Mike thanks for the opportunity uh, it was an absolute pleasure. I'd love to get you back one day uh, and really go in deeper into your high school coaching. I, I uh, personally, I talk to a lot of college coaches uh, on a daily basis uh, for my background, but uh, would love to know, you talked about, you know, you do art for 40, 50 hours a day and then do track, uh, you know, and throwing, uh, how you balance uh, being a high school teacher uh, as well as coaching and not just coaching for a couple hours every day for the high school team doing Madison throws club. And then obviously clinics and podcasts and stuff. So definitely would love to uh, one day, maybe uh, take a deeper dive into uh, high school teaching and coaching. Be happy to cover, talk about those things. That'd be fun. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate you uh, being on tonight and uh, look forward to just seeing more and more uh, great athletes and uh, uh, events that you put on. You do a great job. Thanks, Mike. Stay well.